good afternoon, everybody. Happy Saturday. It's wonderful to have you with us today. My name is Amy Davis. I'm the executive director of New Museum Los Gatos and so honored and delighted to kick our program off this afternoon with our wonderful new partner, Mosaic America. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about why we're here today, um, inspired by our annual juried high school exhibition called Art Now. And our theme for this year for this exhibition is Good Trouble. And we'll dive into that in just a second. But I wanted to first tell you just a little bit about Art Now and what it means to us in our community. It's, um, an, like I said, an annual juried exhibit of high school um, artists throughout Santa Clara County, anywhere from Palo Alto to Gilroy, and of course Los Gatos, um, helping students gain real world experience participating in a museum exhibition. Um, each year we choose a theme. Uh, we get hundreds of submissions and even in these very challenging times received over 500 submissions from local high school artists. I mean, Art is such a wonderful vehicle for expressing ourselves, for coping with times of strife. And um, Numu has been doing this for 10 years running now. We give out about $10,000 in scholarships and awards to students um, who win awards in different categories. And we see an impact, an impact a program like Art Now has when we see the incredible quality of student work that emerges. It is just amazing. Um, I would really love to invite you to check out our virtual exhibition in the link that Michelle just posted for you um, sometime when it's convenient for you 24 hours a day you can see an art exhibit. Uh, it's, it's a really wonderful opportunity to keep engaging with art even when we're at home. Um, I want to quickly say thank you to our sponsors who support we wouldn't, without whose support, we wouldn't be able to have art now. Um, major support is provided by the Michael and Elise Parsons Foundation with additional support from the town of Los Gatos, the Flick family, Los Gatos Morning Rotary, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and Badger Meter. Thank you for your support. Um, so I'll wrap up by saying that Good Trouble came to us as a theme for 2021's Art Now program because we knew that our youth uh, in our community were feeling the current events um, of the pandemic, of Black Lives Matter, of the climate change more acutely than us adults. We wanted to hear what they were going through and how they wanted to express how they were interpreting the global um, issues of the moment. And so we were inspired by John Lewis, congressman and activist who marched with Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement and served his country as a congressman who really believed that in order to move the needle on social issues, we need to stand up for what's right and potentially get in good trouble while doing it. So we're really happy to be here with Mosaic America today who provides an innovative platform for artists from diverse backgrounds to come together, collaborate and co-create world-class multicultural music and dance performances. And as an art museum, we're really um, mainly focused on visual art and local history, but today we're so excited to partner with Mosaic who will show you through a variety of arts experiences, how we can expand our hearts, open our minds, and feel joy from the incredible diversity of talent, culture, and art forms in our region. So without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Usha. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Mosaic. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you. We are delighted to embark on this uh, partnership with New Museum and look forward to many more collaborations to come. Uh, I'm Usha Srinivasan. I am the co-founder and CEO of Mosaic America. And I'd like to begin with a brief introduction. Uh, we are a nonprofit whose mission is to catalyze inclusion and cultivate belonging in diverse communities. Um, those of you who've lived here in Silicon Valley for any length of time probably have experienced firsthand um, the rapid shifts in demographics that have happened over the past three to four decades. And even as we become more diverse, we are actually less integrated. 
um, we eat, pray, play, and celebrate with people who look most like us. And obviously this has led to an erosion in the sense of belonging, sense of community. And not only is that undesirable, it leads to tribalism and a whole bunch of other social ills. It also represents a lost opportunity to realize the true glory of America. So at Mosaic, we believe that addressing these issues calls for a very thoughtful, um, deliberate, intentional approach to bringing people together. And that is something that we believe arts and artists, especially culturally rooted arts, has the power to do. Um, by bringing artists together, artists who are cultural um, ambassadors for their communities, by bringing them together, giving them the time and resources to co-create and co-present works, we bring the communities that they represent together. And it is a very effective way to kind of chip away at these cultural silos that we see around us. And, you know, we have done this programming over the past four years and had a great success with it. Uh, we have a large family of mosaic artists that do our work for us, and we are pleased to be able to bring some of them today. Um, so today's theme, um, celebrating good trouble. You know, here in America and around the globe, we are now faced with some very serious, deep-rooted, complex problems that often seem daunting and insurmountable. So now more than ever, we need to take heed of what the late Congressman John Lewis and civil rights icon John Lewis said. He said, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a year. It is a struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and to get in good trouble, necessary trouble. So what does good trouble mean? Uh, it can certainly be the kind of trouble that John Lewis was engaged in, which is addressing huge societal systemic problems of racism, um, making sure that voting rights was avail were available to all. But it doesn't have to be. Just like tiny drops of water make up the mighty ocean, so too each one of us using the freedom that we have and agency we have can make our own little version of good trouble and it will all add up to create a sea change. Um, so today I'm kind of pleased to, to introduce four members of the Mosaic family who are each troublemakers of their own kind. Um, they use their artistry, in their own spheres of influence to make changes and advance causes that are meaningful to them. Um, they're challenging norms, they're confronting systemic racism and injustice, um, they are advocating for reform, and they're promoting new ways of thinking and being. So at this point, I'd like to welcome our four panelists and artists. We have Latoya Fernandez, Lisa Rosenberg, both of whom are poets, Ray Furuta, and Urmila Vidali. Um, what I'm going to do now is um, basically read out a short bio for each of our artists so you understand um, their backgrounds. Um, and then I'm going to provide a prompt which forms kind of the structure of the rest of the program. So beginning with Latoya. Hello, Latoya. Welcome. Um, Latoya is an educator, activist, and community leader. And she dedicates her career to teaching students equity and justice as a restorative justice coordinator, Latoya has served in local San Jose schools, supporting students, educators, and families through cultural responsiveness, restorative practices, and community engagement. Latoya continues to serve the community in various roles, including as the Dean of Students at Downtown College Prep El Camino, as a Neighborhoods Commissioner in District 3, a member for the Tech Museum's Ed Educatory Advisory Board, sorry, Educator Advisory Board, and Chair for the Youth Outreach Committee for Women's March San Jose. Alongside these roles, Latoya continues to be a community advocate who's passionate about creating platforms for youth. So please join me in welcoming Latoya. Then we have Ray Furuta. Ray Furuta is a dear friend and a cherished member of the Mosaic family. He has been a music director for Mosaic um, and he is a Mosaic fellow. Ray has toured worldwide as a concertizing soloist, flute soloist and teacher. He has performed with Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road Ensemble, Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center, the United Nations, and more. 
He is the artistic director and founder of Chamber Music Silicon Valley and a music professor at Santa Clara University, where he, is, he teaches performance practice and community engagement. He is also taught as a guest lecturer at Stanford and NYU and many other universities. Honored as a distinguished alumnus in 2016, Ray has earned his doctors of musical arts degree from Stony Brook University. Um, Ray is well known to a lot of people here in Silicon Valley and we are honored to have him. Um, and you will see why we um, value him so greatly later in this program. Um, next, Lisa Rosenberg. Uh, Re Lisa served as the second poet laureate of San Mateo County and is the author of A Different Physics a poetry collection that draws on her years in science and engineering. A former Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University, she has a keen interest in the commonality of arts and sciences and in bringing shared tools to industry, education, and public talks. Her poetry and essays explore natural and cultural landscapes, the art of making, and the drive to question inherited models. Uh, Lisa is looking forward to an upcoming Gerasi residency. Welcome, Lisa Rosenberg. And last but not least, we have our Mosaic Youth Ambassador, Urmila Vudali. Urmila is a senior at Saratoga High and will be attending UC Berkeley this fall. As a freshman, she co-founded Mosaic Saratoga High, a club to promote multicultural understanding through the arts. She began training in the Indian classical dance form of Bharatanatyam at age five and made her solo debut at age nine. Urmila was fortunate to train in many other dance styles and has performed as a guest artist with New Ground Theater Dance. She also serves as a commissioner on Santa Clara County's Youth Task Force and on the student board at the Tech Museum, where she's tasked with the task force with convening the annual Youth Climate Action Summit. Thank you all so very much. Um, we are excited to have you here. And now I'm going to um, uh, present the quote that we are talking about, which will structure our conversation. Um, freedom is not a state. It is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can sit, finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must take, and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair and just society. So we'd like each of our artists to kind of talk to us about what the freedom to make good trouble means to them. How do you exercise freedom in your spheres of influence? And then maybe give us a little bit of um, an example of your work. So we are gonna begin with Latoya Fernandez. Latoya. Hello. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, very honored to be here. Um, and before I, I present, I would definitely like to share just the notion of good trouble and what that has meant for me as an activist, as a community leader, and as an artist. Um, it means tackling the systems that are oppressing our people. And for me, that starts with the youth. When I was a young person, um, I recognized very early on that the systems around me were very corrupt, especially the education system. I knew it was a place that was created to not be conducive to, to my style of learning and not just my style of learning, but other students that looked like me. And so as I got older and I used my artistry to call these systems out, I also realized that I had the power to change these systems. And that's what led me to the classroom. That's what led me to becoming a teacher and later an administrator. Because I saw once, uh, I, I saw once again that these oppressive systems that they use to keep us down, they were mirroring these same systems in the schools with these arbitrary, uh, arbitrary methods of discipline, suspending students, kicking them out of class, um, talking down at them, and not providing a culturally sound experience for the, the super diverse community um, and families here. And so for me, starting Good Trouble means going to those systems, challenging them to be better, calling them out when they're wrong, and calling those in who are willing and ready to make those changes. And it takes a lot of courage. It also takes a lot of having to stand on your own. Times you do feel isolated, but at the end of the day, doing what's right isn't always what's easy, but it's what's necessary. And so I think that's what grounds my work. 
Um, and I'm always in trouble, so it's all good. That's why I, I work for myself. So I don't have to answer to anyone anymore, but the community. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a piece with you all. And it's called, uh, uh, Dear, um, it's called Angry Black Woman, A Letter to Women. You don't wanna be perceived as an angry black woman, says them. We are constantly told either to manage ourselves and our energy or expected to navigate through emotional reactions to us to provide comfort and safety for oppressors and power players. Dear humans who look like me, when you tell me to tone it down, sis, you don't want them thinking you're another angry black woman, I feel hurt. I'm hurt because you know the implications of this comment. You know what it is to be like me and how hard it is to work hard for my success and still be told it's not enough. You know that I have reasons and rights to be angry and you're angry too, even if you don't say it out loud or you deny it heavily. Because if you didn't know, you wouldn't care so much about your hairstyle, your weight, your way, the way that people perceive you in a group when you're the only black person. You wouldn't feel insecure about your intelligence and weirdly pissed at yourself that you may let things slide, giving the appearance that you're a pushover. But really, you are trying desperately hard to spare people from your wrath. You know, sis, you know like no other. And in knowing it can make it hard for us to be together and to unite as sisters. In a sad way, you hate me for being so vocal and so loud. However, when James Brown's I'm Black and I'm Proud starts to play, your spirit is just as free and vibrant as mine because being a Wakandan is powerful stuff. You know like I know what it means to be a Black queen and among one of the most hated and unprotected groups of people in this world. You know what it means to be a Black queen. You know what it means. Because of the pain from my past and pattern of distrust I face, we've faced. No one will ever get you like I do, sis. When you tell me to calm down that I'm being too angry, I may feel like you're either sipping the food lid or you're on their side. But I understand. I understand when you tell me to tone it down, sis. You don't want them thinking you're another angry black woman. I feel hurt, but I understand. I understand because someone told you that once before, twice before, 10 times before, when you were just standing up for yourself. I understand because your teachers tell you to speak up. Your mama tells you to be brave and stand up, but never against her. Your father may not have said much, or maybe he said it all. And the Bible tells you to be still. I understand how overwhelming it can be to navigate a life as a human being and then having to carry the added weight society places on being a black woman. I understand because the pain from our past is similar, but not shared. And though you may know what it is like to be me and I you, we will never truly be each other. I understand that my expectations are high and unrealistic for most because my self-sacrifice and loud cry, drawing all eyes on me, all shots fired at me, give a perception that I'm a self-righteous masochist. I understand because you were also made to believe that we would never bring the table or the seats and that there would only be room enough for one diversity hire, one affirmative action spot, and she better behave. I understand. That's why I'm not angry with you. Because like I said earlier, no one gets you like I do, sis. Dear humans who kind of look like me, my brown folks, when you tell me anything having to do with managing myself based on my race, I need you to understand that even if my face isn't expressing it, I'm rolling my eyes so far in the back of my head that I can see your words stabbing me in the back like knives. Before you say anything, I'm going to go ahead and stop you right there. Stop. Nope. Shut up and listen. We have been mistreated, but not equally. We have struggled and some of our struggles are similar, but not the same. To clarify for all of you who are mad right now, thinking that I'm racist and attempting to further victimize myself and my black people, what I'm saying is the black and brown struggle is different. As a matter of fact, 
Most of the racism and discrimination I've encountered have come from other women of color. The term used to make it seem like we're all in the same boat, but no, we're not. My ancestors came in through force on the Amistad. My ancestors came here on a boat, forced here on a boat. We are not in the same boat. There has never been a question about who was worth more or less. Saying our lives matter is saying your lives matter. And all lives matter when our lives matter. Let's make one thing clear. Anti-Blackness exists in every cultural and racial structure. Dear humans who don't look like me, let me start off by saying, because God forbid I express an opinion as a marginalized person without having to give a disclaimer to protect the feelings of those who will claim chastised by these words. This is not directed at every white person. Do you see how I did that? How I didn't judge every single person of a race based on the transgressions of their ancestors. I didn't falsely stereotype based on the experience of an individual. See, when you do this, you shape opinions shared in gossip that all of a sudden have merit as legitimate factual facts. You must do your soul work, your shadow work, your heart work before we can discuss these concepts, white people. Anyways, if that disclaimer wasn't enough, you can stop listening, even though this is the end, which is precisely why I chose to end this way, because words are powerful. And even if you disagree, you digested a challenging and uncomfortable message. And let's be crystal, crystal clear. You would never choose to walk a mile in these dusty black shoes. Thank you. Thank you, Latoya. That was powerful. Um, a lot of food for thought for all of us. Thank you for speaking your truth, speaking truth to power and always making good trouble. Um, now I'd like to welcome Lisa Rosenberg, also a poet. Um, Lisa, would you like to um, tell us what you think of the freedom to create good trouble and, and share with us how you do this? Thank you, Usha. And thank you to my fellow ancestor artists here today, to Numu for hosting us and to Mosaic for building this program that I'm so delighted has uh, blossomed forth from Silicon Valley to America. So I, um, I was raised in a questioning, noisy, troublemaking culture, and I live and practice in what's often thought of as a quiet art. And the kind of intersection of those is really about um, the notion of the more you can expand your thinking, the more possibilities will be open to you. And I think that really, holds true for freedom, whether we're calling it freedom or we're calling it um, making trouble, that um, kind of softening the boundaries of how we define freedom, how we define trouble. Um, we might start out thinking of it purely as um, something that invites an either or, and we could maybe move to something that invites us just to expand um, the way we create new options for ourselves, um, new means of coming into our own power and changing the structures that have limited that, that surround us. Um, in thinking about the John Lewis quote in particular about good trouble, I thought, well, yeah, so the first step to, rec to making trouble is recognizing that you're in it. Um, and of course, that's often made painfully obvious to us from the outside. But whatever type of trouble we are addressing, and there's always another level to that. There's the system that feeds it. And so coming into greater freedom um, will always mean it's an ongoing journey. We haven't really arrived and that there's going to be other levels and um, more learning and work ahead of us. As a poet, um, this really ends up being often about voice and about authorship. And what is authorship? That's really owning the voice and self-possession. 
And even if we are writing, as people often ask, for ourselves or for a greater, you know, usually we're writing for an unknown audience and hopefully as many readers as possible who can connect in whatever way with what we put out there. Um, that, that aspect of voice is something we're always building and discovering. And so finding ways to exercise, build and have confidence in that voice and to give ourselves permission, especially, um, you know, as I was raised for women, it often felt like we had less permission to cause trouble, take up space, make noise and question the models that have taught us that, um, the models that have been here before us, before, you know, predating um, our most recent ancestors. And as in, you know, when I looked at what, what do I really mean by upsetting these? And of course, in art, we're talk, we often talk about upsetting the status quo. What does that mean? Um, that can mean anything. And all art is considered criticism or an act of political power, just because you are claiming your voice and putting yourself out there. Um, I think if we, if we can notice that even creating a disturbance, just a little bit of a disturbance with a new voice, a new observation, a new point of view, we are disrupting the status quo and we're creating an opening to start seeing things differently, perceiving things differently. And that includes our possibilities for claiming some power. What does this look like in poems? Um, as Usha and I were talking about what to share today, what to present. Um, and I, I kind of looked at a few different poems that might fit this. I realized that it's almost like an autobiography of the steps that I went through noticing that I could create a voice, claim a voice, move into spaces that were typically not open to me, whether as a poet, as a person or both, and it's usually both. And so my first acts were really to take on the voice of something that felt either oppressive or frightening or domineering to me. And that, you know, I, ironically or not, that usually ended up being a voice with some snark in it. But um, I chose a short one from the kind of corporate world that I, that I started my working life in. Um, and I just wanted to take over the voice of perhaps inanimate objects and expose them for some of the traps that they presented. Um, this first short poem is called Biography File. Your past, flat on the table and dull as tin can be pruned beyond belief. Even in the concrete, there are excess facts. A street lined with sycamore, your mother's hair, the diary of your adolescence can all be omitted. Give me certificates, dates and degrees, professional affiliations. There are figures and folders like mouths to fill, lists of faces, I am voracious for the set type, the paraphrase, the one title that will send you ripe for filing in drawers with innumerable divisions. So that was a very early piece. Um, the next kind of step in that was recognizing, for me, recognizing um, the models that were not only inherited, but that weren't even noticed or questioned that form are thinking whether they're models about um, conforming to gender roles or uh, the professional opportunities available to us, um, family roles, any of those, and especially the models for thinking about how the universe works. And so this, this piece is called Space 2, not really as in 2.0, but as a companion to an earlier poem called Space. There is nowhere to go because we are already here our sphere among others, our egg-shaped path around the sun, in space we name the sky. It's all sky above our feet, between us, carrying the weight of myth and breath, the Tohi's metal call at dawn, 
my child's call through the fragile din that is the world knowing itself and not knowing. The moon lived as a flat, if lovely, disk until the afternoon that I saw pass across the sun, a black yoke, a body. Then all the sky bodies I could not see changed at once, together, freed of my mind's eye, into the shapes that they had always known. So I'm just going to share a couple of more very short poems. Um, one of them is uh, about recognizing these past models and not coming directly in opposition to them. This is um, a titled from one of my favorite fossils, Archaeopteryx. Perfect as Nike. Head bent. Feathers arrested. The imprint of upturned wings, a likeness to wonder at. Your last flight, dear prototype. Um, so I'm going to close with two poems that really moved into this next phase of learning, um, which has been so rich for me, both in art and in community, and coincided with being a public servant poet and trying to bring educational and performance programs out into the community so that people could discover their own voices through poetry and their own connections to larger community. Um, this first is called perseverance. Take back those keepers of wonder. The swan's back, brown creeper and golden grouse. The flirty tails, the talons arched like a map's edge. I'm finished with plumage. Etch me a classic, a girl like Sisyphus in pewter hues pushing a corner of sky. And I'll close with um, the act of remaking and reclaiming models. Um, most of us have seen that Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man, that uh, figure on a circle, and that stands for so much of Western thought and science and the canon. And I wanted to start to free that model, at least from gender, if not from some of the other constraints around it, such as race and ethnicity. So this is Vitruvian child. Vitruvian child with your arms flung wide, your bare feet riding that faithful circle day into night, day upon age upon eon. Reach for my hand, out beyond the box tips, where your fingers stretch toward eternity, where your likenesses thrive untethered to provinces of gender, to purviews of paper and ink. Tell me how harmony swirl from the famous shapes that frame you, how your many selves dwell in that flowering of limbs. Tell us what freedoms you've devised how an open frame becomes a plaything through every season and in every light. Thank you so much for being with us here. And thank you, Usha. Thank you, Lisa. That was beautiful. I can't wait to read your book of poems. Um, if you will please um, drop in a link. Yes. And uh, Lisa's I will do that. Um, that was just incredible. Thank you. Uh, we will also be sending this information around um, in an email um, pro probably tomorrow that, or um, on Monday. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Ray Furuta, who is, as I said, a dear friend and really a brilliant musician. But from our vantage point, what Ray brings to the table that is truly unique is the ability to kind of take whatever music or art that people have and be able to create something, create a, mu a mosaic, if you will, um, that speaks to people, that transports them emotionally, 
um, to a different place um, over time, you know, back in time. And one project in particular, Ray, I would love for you to speak about after, you know, you can speak about anything at all, but what I, and the first time we worked together was when we had uh, commissioned a piece with you called Precious Cars. And now how powerful this was in telling the story of Japanese American internment, but telling it in a way that appealed to a much broader um, group of people. So I just wanted to, that was gonna be the first video we share. So I'd like you to maybe at the end of your, um, your conversation set us up with that one. Sure. So um, first, I guess what I, I wanted to share in terms of freedom and, and good trouble um, specifically has to do uh, in the context of my training as a Western classical musician, um, where I went to school in New York and was essentially told what I was supposed to do, what was successful, what was not. Um, and and were, I say we as, as conservatory trained musicians uh, are sort of brought on a certain path that was uh, designed way before us. And so um, eventually I, I started to, to really contemplate about that concept of, of the way things should be or the way things should be appreciated or the way things should be experienced. Um, this idea that anything should be something that's established, uh, at least within my classical music realm, uh, seemed a little uh, fraudulent eventually, <laughs> in a way. Like, it didn't seem to make sense. Like, why, why does it have to be that way? And, and so I started just basically experimenting uh, with different things, meeting other like-minded people like uh, those at Mosaic who weren't afraid to try something for the sake of, of discovering something, um, knowing that there could very well be growing pains. Um, but like anything that has those kind of growing pains, there's always that better side of, of the uh, experience. And um, that's something that I've kind of, really embodied within my work, um, especially more recently. Uh, and so um, this particular project that Usha was mentioning uh, titled Precious Scars uh, was designed to serve as the storytelling vehicle uh, for the um, incarcerated Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans who were uh, incarcerated <laughs> uh, during World War II. And, um, you know, Usha and Priya met with me, we met at a coffee shop and just kind of started hashing ideas, but they really just gave me free reign to like, this is our goal, make something really cool. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I had this idea that, you know, the history of these camps is rooted in a lot of um, racism and, and politics and, and things like that. And I found that uh, it would be great and powerful and profound to use voices that are experiencing that same type of xenophobia that um, Japanese Americans were experiencing then, now. Uh, and so I, I sort of corralled a few artists um, to co-write this piece with me. And so um, there's myself, there's Vico Diaz, who is a bass player based in um, Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, there, uh, and then there is Amr Salim, who is a French horn player. Um, he is of e uh, Egyptian, um, heritage, but is currently based in Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, we, we wrote our own individual pieces to serve as, as I had said, this vehicle to tell a story, one specific story, but through the lens of, of others uh, who, who can relate to that 
sort of um, experience in their own way. And so that's, that's really what the goal was, was to show that, um, you know, we're all sort of experiencing these things and history repeats itself, all these things. And so with that, uh, you know, we wanted to bring in so many elements of multiculturalism and, uh, and I, I think that this would yeah. be a great time to show the video. Show the video, yeah. Stephen, if you could show the first video, yeah. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. February 19th, 1942, nearly 10 weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, granting the War Department the incredible power to create and oversee military exclusion areas. Although the order did not identify any particular group, it was almost exclusively used to incarcerate Americans of Japanese descent. Thank you, Ray, that was beautiful. And we have another video that we'd like to share that we would, I'd like you to talk about first. And this is from the Chamber Music um, Silicon Valley Festival that you had a couple of years ago um, from, I believe it was the Rite of Spring. Um, yeah. And so I please set this up for the audience and then we'll roll the video. Sure, so uh, this, this clip, um is from the Silicon Valley Music Festival, which is uh, a festival that I, I founded um, and is produced by Chamber Music Silicon Valley. And uh, this, this production was an interesting kind of pivot in CMSV's identity um, and an exciting one. And uh, one that, that really um, also asked that question of like, 
why should things be appreciated in, a, in X, Y, Z way? Why does it need to be appreciated that way? Um, and so we called this production Primal Reboot because we wanted to sort of relate it to this historical idea while also um, bringing it to the future. And uh, we took this piece titled Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky, who is a Russian composer, a uh, very famous piece if you are um, a, a classical music appreciator, you probably have heard it. And uh, we had it arranged for a very small group. It's normally like a hundred piece orchestra. Uh, and we were playing it with, I think it was six or seven people. And then uh, the piece is also typically uh, uh, set to uh, classical ballet. And uh, we wanted to reboot that as well. So we commissioned uh, four different amazing dancers of completely different uh, dance worlds to choreograph to this Western classical piece of music. Um, and then in addition, which you will see uh, fairly vividly, uh, we commissioned two digital media artists to create a sort of immersive stage that also kind of had that same primal reboot vibe. Um, again, creating this whole experience that is not necessarily one that is supposed to be, you know, depending on how you're a how you are coming in as an appreciator of any of the arts uh, that are involved in this um, project. And uh, it, 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 um, it alludes to this idea of coexistence too, you know, that arts, we can all coexist and we can all amplify each other uh, in, in a really positive way. So that's, that's what this um, video is, so enjoy.
That was wonderful. Thank you, Ray. Um, and I'd like to, while I have you on screen, I'd like to invite Urmila. Urmila, can you turn on your video? Oh, there we go. Um, you may not recognize her in that video, but um, that was Urmila at the very end. Urmila Godali is the Bharatanatyam dancer. Um, and as you can see, when Ray was able to, when Ray kind of broke the mold and decided to kind of question norms and bring in some of these very unconventional um, dances in the context of, of chamber music, um, what that did was actually it engaged people and brought them into the audience that would not normally uh, come to a classical music musical festival. So, um, you know, this is kind of the mosaic principle by bringing artists from diverse traditions together, you bring audiences together. And that creates shared experiences that are kind of foundational to creating a sense of um, belonging. Um, what I'd like to talk now, maybe Urmila, you can tell us a little bit about your experience. First of all, what does freedom to create good trouble mean to you? And how do you do that in your practice? Yeah, so um, this experience with Ray was definitely a very interesting one uh, for me. Um, the music was completely different to what I was used to, the rhythms, the scenery. Um, and during this experience, when I was choreographing and really learning the music and trying to figure out what to present, um, I found myself learning a lot more about cultures that I had not been exposed to. Um, as part of classical music, um, I learned a lot about the history of Rite of Spring and its controversial history, a lot about um, the music, the rhythm patterns, um, and about how it's portrayed in ballet. And I think that learning experience really embodies what good trouble is for me through dance. Um, so as mentioned before, I'm a classical but not tune dancer. I've been dancing for 13 years now. And um, Bharatanatyam is a pretty rigid um, form. Uh, there's a lot that um, students have to go through and it's kind of very secluded to our Indian community, to our South Indian community. And I found myself um, for the first few years of my Bharatanatyam career, really sticking to the norms of a Bharatanatyam dancer. I really only performed for audiences that I was familiar with um, and really only experienced dance that I was familiar with. But um, as I grew older and I got to explore the world of dance a little bit more, I realized that pushing the boundaries of dance and exploring other forms, styles, choreography, um, not only allows me to learn about other cultures, especially in this wonderfully diverse area that we live in, but also um, it helps bring audiences together. People that usually want to watch Bharatanatyam uh, coming to a show where I collaborate with someone else will get to experience not only another dance form watching it, but also interact with another audience member perhaps um, that they might not have met before. So um, with this concept in mind, I decided to start a club at my school, Saratoga High School. And it was uh, the Mosaic Saratoga High Club. And it was founded on this idea that we can use art to connect students who are isolated in their cultural silos. Um, and that um, resulted in us starting a Mosaic Saratoga Festival uh, at my school. And it involves so many youth dancers and other performers and their amazing, wonderful collaborations that I got to share with my student body. And it really honed in on the history of California and the Bay Area and just how diverse we are and really learning to appreciate um, the other people around us and learning about the other cultures around us. And one of the pieces that was performed at Mosaic Saratoga High's festival was called Confluencia, which is something that I got to choreograph with a flamenco dancer, Fanny Ara. Um, this was one of my first cross-cultural collaborations. I really enjoyed it. They have very similar um, rhythmic patterns and even music styles and it can be seen uh, even today. So when I got to start working with Fanny, we started really exploring these um, 
roots. And uh, we came up with this wonderfully rhythmic piece. It's called Confluencia. And I believe we have a video of it. Um, Is awesome. Uh, Urmila, you want to talk briefly about the other piece? The first piece is called The Flower Cellar, um, and it's also another one of the cross-cultural collaborations that I got to um, work on. Uh, it was with an Arab music ensemble. Um, it featured an oud, which is the string instrument that was being played in a singer. And it was essentially like a folk song that talked about a girl who was trying to sell her flowers in the village. And um, we felt that there was a lot of commonality in the tales that are told uh, in Bharatanatyam and in Hindu mythology. And there is definitely an expressive aspect to Bharatanatyam that uh, we could explore through this piece. <laughs> So again, finding those commonalities allowed me to learn a little bit about a culture that I never would have um, had the opportunity to um, explore before. And pushing the boundaries of my traditional Bharatanatyam and my dance um, and causing that good trouble really allowed me to widen my horizons. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, thanks to all of our artists, I'd like to welcome all of you back on camera. And um, let's 
uh, you know, open up to the audience. We would love to hear your comments, your suggestions, and of course, questions um, to anybody. You know, this is going to be a little bit messy, but let's bring everybody on camera. And uh, I want to also introduce Kimberly Snyder, who's the deputy director of New Museum of Las uh, New Museum, and then um, who else? Michelle uh, Davy, uh, Michelle Jubilee. Uh, who is the education program uh, officer. Um, so maybe Michelle and Amy, you can field, sorry, and Kimberly, you can field some, some of the questions that have come through. Thank you so much. This has been so inspiring and so wonderful. I'm so excited to dive in and ask some questions. So first off, a question came in for Latoya. Um, so Latoya, your poem, Angry Black Woman, rings so true and is so powerful. What are your thoughts on how we can communicate these messages to youth? On the one hand, adults tell youth to listen up, and on the other, oftentimes to just be quiet, um, as if adults have all the answers. So maybe a follow-up question are, is, what are some things you feel youth can actually teach us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I actually um, published a book last year called Truth, an Empowerment Guide for Youth and Allies that answers these kinds of questions. Um, and, and so I'll just share a, a piece of, of, of my book. Um, when it comes to this stuff, number one, like youth already pretty much get it. It's really us, the adults who don't get it, and they're waiting for us to get it. Um, and, and so with them, it's more so about teaching them the power of allyship. What does it mean to stand for your peer uh, if they're a part of a marginalized group? And I'm talking about black and brown students. I'm talking about women. I'm talking about LGBTQ uh, community members. What does it look like to actually have empathy and compassion and to stand up and stand with your peers? I think if we focus more um, with our youth on building those really um, uh, humanistic communities in the classroom where they hold each other accountable if they see someone doing something that seems like it's coming from a place of hate or or um or a lack of compassion i think when we create that 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 kind of culture in the classroom they then hold each other accountable to being humanitarians right and i think that's what it is is just teaching them how to be um, authentic in their relationships with each other. Like you see something, you say something and it's okay. And also some of these things that you might be taking stands for might not be um, in line with the, the things that your parents might be teaching you. And I'll just give a harsh example of this. Some of your family members might tell you that being a member of the LGBTQ community is wrong and that people from that community deserve what they get. And that is not a humanistic approach to life, period. And so also letting our youth know that it's okay if your views differ from your parents. That doesn't make you a good person and them a bad person, but you have to decide what kind of person you're gonna be. Are you gonna be someone that values every human life at an equal level and take a stand when you see something wrong? And that's what we want to instill in our kids. And then finally, if you're an adult that's working with youth, it is imperative that you run that space as if the youth voice is the most important voice in the room, allowing them to lead and guide the vibe and the instruction in the classroom. Sometimes that means throwing out your lesson plans and doing what fits the moment. Wow, I just got chills. That's such an incredible piece of advice, I think, for us in education and thinking about how to have meaningful spaces for youth to really be empowered. Thank you so much. I'll pass it to Kimberly. We have another question. Yeah, I, I love your answer, Latoya. I completely agree. Constantly, we're thinking about how do we amplify youth voices? How do we listen? Then I just it's inspiring to hear you talk. Um, so this question is for Lisa. When you move into unwelcome spaces, how have you not, how have you not only held on to your own truth, but have, have others seen, dare I say, appreciate it? And has Mosaic helped you to do this? Well, okay, so that's kind of three huge questions, or th two huge questions and one more concise question. But you know, the 
honest truth is um, I haven't always been able to hold my own and build agreement or you know connection, especially when I was in my 20s. And I felt like I was in a lot of um, pretty sexist or misogynist uh, workplaces. But in terms of unwelcome spaces, you know, poetry, like physics, I mean, they're rarely the kinds of things that people just come up and ask you to talk about. Um, so you're always creating, you, you have to always create connection, you know, find commonality. And poetry is a great lab for that. You know, we work in, we work from connections, connecting different things through imagery, through emotional, personal association, historical associations, things we don't even realize are connected. And we work through juxtaposition, which is just kind of like a, a sidelong way of, of finding connection or putting us in a place of not being able to not notice how different things are connected. So um, it's usually a matter of, um, you know, if you can't make people listen, but you can try to meet them where they are and you can always be the change, you know, be the model, be a resource. That's what artists are continually doing. You're modeling a different possibility and you are a resource for when people either are ready, um, if circumstances are more, more urgent, um, you not only have to be this, you have to be this whether or not you have any permission or even if it means you know, you, you get in serious trouble. Um, but I, I just wanna be honest about the fact that it's not always easy to do this. Um, and when I was, you know, like a young engineer and I felt like everyone I worked with was my dad's age and gender. And if I had to come and give someone really bad news <laughs> um, or contest something, you know, if I walked into a cubicle that was filled with nude posters of women, Sometimes I just shriveled up and left and could not hold my own. And as I got older, it got easier to do that. Um, but part of it was, was that I was also working in a place where I wasn't sure of the depth of my connection. And I was more inclined to look outward for the problems, not realizing that some things are inside and um, they're, they're both connected. So, you know, what is the system? What is my relationship to it? How do I, how do I work either against it or create a bigger space for myself in here? And, and what about all these people who are ignoring it? You know, that's always the question if you're in any kind of minority um, population in any aspect of life. Um, how do we get the, the larger community to hear us or to be interested in us? And again, I'll go back to there's there's always going to be something that's common. And it's not that we have to placate people, but just talk to them on, you know, on that level. I can't tell you the number of times as a public servant poet, you get put in a situation where you're in a large, either a small room or a huge theater with amp, you know, public space with people who not only don't have much interest in poetry, but didn't know they were going to be subjected to it. And so you you have to build some kind of connection. You know, I a room full of first responders being awarded for firefighting and they find out they're going to hear poetry now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you build that? As for mosaic, I mean, mosaic is giving us the soil we need as artists to not only have other resources and models and be that for each other, but to expand our notions of what that means. So, you know, we might all think that we have our kind of bubble or circle of what our diverse group of friends and family are. And it's always going to be bigger when we bring those together. And I'm so grateful for also to Usha and Priya for pushing us always with events that make us think of things in a different light and, and, and really you know, push us into building out those connections and learning. And like suddenly you have new rhythms available, new palettes new sets of imagery, new voices, and artists who understand um, the struggles of making art and being heard. So thank you for that great question. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. 
Um, I have a quick question for Urmila, and, and then there's a couple of other questions, one for Ray and one for New Museum that have come through. Um, Urmila, I know you work um, at the Tech Museum, you're on the task force for Youth Climate Action Summit. Have, how have you found, um, or rather, have you found a way to kind of bring art to that big topic of addressing climate change? Yeah, so um, I learned um, that art is usually used um, to make topics a little bit more approachable for people. And it really can create empathy, um, especially for such a heavy and daunting issue like climate change. Um, so as part of the tech uh, student board, um, I helped uh, create something called our Artists in the Climate Crisis Showcase. Um, and it featured a lot of youth artists who use their art form to address climate change and how they felt about what's happening in the world. And um, that ranged from poetry to dance to music um, to visual arts. And um, it really just helped people feel like they are together in that issue. And I genuinely believe that art can be such a powerful tool for spreading messages and convincing people to fight for a cause and uh, creating a sense of community. And so I found that that was a really useful um, way to um, start a conversation about climate change. That's wonderful. Uh, question for Ray. Ray, the question here is, do you find that audiences show up in good numbers when they know the piece you created is collaborative or is it a harder sell? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say that it always depends on how you market something. Um, and I don't know if I would ever necessarily say that I, I I don't know. I, I find that how I try to spin things is that everyone is in for a special unparalleled experience. And I kind of spin it that way. And that's what sort of piques everyone's interest. And then whoever is involved can speak to their audiences specifically um, when we're all sort of in it together and we're all gonna have this very different experience. And for those who know what my productions are like, they, they usually know what to expect or they don't, I guess maybe. Like they'll be surprised either way. And so, um, you know, I, I think that the more people involved, usually the more people who show up to answer it in short. Um, and it always makes the experience more fun and different. Uh, we find this with our mosaic programming as well, right? How do you market something like Confluentia or others? It's very difficult for people to kind of wrap their head around something they've never experienced. Um, so we have to be creative about just getting them in the door. But once they've experienced it, the kind of fellowship they feel, the emotion they feel um, is something they'll carry with them. And what we've now find is, and I'm sure this is true, Ray, for your uh, chamber, uh, CMSV programs as well, people associate us with a certain, you know, certain emotion that we are able to evoke through our programming. They know there's always going to be something interesting, something new, something that explores common threads, not just showcasing direct uh, diversity. And um, then it becomes easier over time. Um, thank you. Question for New Museum is how has New Museum changed to meet the 2020 moments? I'm so happy that somebody asked us, to us, asked us a question. And it's a really thoughtful question because 2020 was, I think, challenging for, so, for all of us. And it was a time for us to be introspective and really dig deep. And as a museum, um, to realize that we aren't neutral and to realize that we really have a platform and a, a way that we can bring people together and amplify voices. And how do we do that in a thoughtful meaningful, genuine way. And in turn, if the first step was internally, just thinking about, okay, what can we do just internally to address these issues that are going on? And then how do we show that externally? Um, 
And so a lot of it was looking at a lot of our programming and a lot of the things that, you know, okay, these are the steps we can take. These are the, this is step one, this is step two. Um, so with a lot of our programming, it was like, okay, let's make our programming free. Let's remove a barrier to entry. Let's reach out to more artists. Um, for example, this collaboration with Mosaic was one of those things. Like, let's be a place to start a dialogue. Let's be a place where we can come together. Um, and, you know, beyond that, just continuing to build and ask the hard questions and also be open to tough criticisms and taking it humbly and growing from it. Um, so I think those are the things we've done. And for 2020, I mean, one of the reasons was like the, we picked this art now theme, good trouble was to challenge the students to challenge the, to give the teachers also something that they could speak to their, stu their students about like, what does it mean to get in good trouble? How are you getting in good trouble? How can you be an advocate? How can you be an ally? Um, so those are the things that we're, we have worked on and continue to work on and plan to continue working on. So if anybody else wants to jump in from the team, go ahead. <laughs> This is, thank, uh, go ahead, Amy, please. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Kim. You did such a beautiful job summing up our efforts at New Museum Los Gatos. Um, I don't have much to add except for, you know, I've always believed that some of the best art makes us have these conversations, makes us a little uncomfortable and gives us an opportunity to really talk with each other, you know, instead of boy, that art makes me uncomfortable, I'm gonna walk away. Let's engage, let's challenge ourselves, let's have difficult conversations and come away more enlightened. Um, and, you know, we really believe that the museum is, should be a safe, you know, as an art history cultural institution, we need to be that place for engagement, contemplation and representation in order to be an asset and be relevant to our region. So. Yeah, thank you for that awesome question. And we we really look forward to the future of our external and internal efforts to address these important conversations. Wonderful. It's great to hear about kind of the um, you you the museum meeting the moment with some very important significant changes um, and opening up and pushing the boundaries of what a museum typically does to include people like us. So we are grateful for that. Um, thank you everyone for participating um, today and for sending in your questions. We have a very special treat as we send you, as we say goodbye. But before we do that, thank you Latoya Fernandez. Thank you Lisa Rosenberg, Rafe Ruta and Urmila Vudali. We will be sharing information on all of them, you know, sending you um, their website information. But um, if you have any questions or comments, please do reach out to us. We are on Facebook as is New Museum. Uh, we are at Mosaic America and uh, New Museum is at, at New, Mu, uh, New Museum Los Gatos. Um, so uh, let me just, um, with that, Stephen, if you will just roll our last video, which is going to be a fabulous uh, treat. It is again, one of Ray's works. Um, he uh, created and arranged this piece called La Vibora del Cascabel. And uh, again, it just showcases his genius. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the weekend and we will see you again at a, a future program. Thank you, New Museum. <laughs>